Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon, at least here in the Pacific time zone. Uh, my name is David Kennedy. I am the former director of the Bill Lane Center for the American West, and it's my great privilege and honor to host this session this afternoon. Uh, where we're going to discuss uh, Steve Inskeep's new book, Imperfect Union, How Jesse and John Fremont Mapped the West, Invented Celebrity, and Helped Cause the Civil War. Uh, this discussion today is one in a series of COVID-era events that the Lane Center is sponsoring that have to do with a range of issues affecting the Western region of North America, which we define as the uh, United States west of 100th Meridian, Canada west of Ontario, and all of Mexico. That uh, half continental area is our unit of analysis and our subject matter. And of course, we think that everything that happens in this region has a history, and we're going to talk about some pretty important aspects of the history of it today. Uh, our author is Steve Inskeep. Uh, he will be familiar to many, if not all of you, as the uh, host of Morning Edition on National Public Radio. Uh, Steve, I'm Sorry to say, it's not a Westerner by birth. He's a Hoosier, which is Midwest. So maybe that qualifies him at least partly uh, as a, some kind of Westerner. Um, he has covered the Pentagon. He covered the Bush, uh, George W. Bush presidential campaign. He's covered the Afghan and Iraq wars. He's been at NPR since 1996. And I'm pleased to say this is not his first book, nor even his first book about history. He's written on life and death in Karachi. He's written on the year of Andrew Jackson, especially Jackson's relations with Native Americans, a very controversial subject, to put it mildly. And today we're talking about this book published in the last calendar year, 2020, Imperfect Union, which is about John C. Fremont and as well about his spouse, Jesse Fremont. So I'm going to let Steve talk to us a little bit about the book, and then we will transition to some conversation between Steve and Emily Greenfield, who I, I will introduce in due course. But Steve, over to you. Thank you for the introduction, David. I really appreciate it. And it's an honor to be here and an honor to be talking to the Center for the American West. Uh, you mentioned Indiana maybe not being so Westish, but I want to mention that in the time that I write about in this book, the 1840s and 50s, Indiana was considered part of the West. In the early years of the American Republic, of course, uh, California was not even part of the United States. Uh, and the Louisiana Purchase, of course, was filled with native nations, but was regarded as largely unsettled, of course, from the United States perspective. And my home state was the West and Abraham Lincoln was growing up there in a kind of remote farm. And, and, and maybe that's part of the reason that I have felt so attached for some years now to the story of westward expansion, the westward expansion of the United States. Both of the histories that you mentioned are uh, about that theme. The story of Andrew Jackson and the Cherokees is an early story of America's westward expansion. In that period, the American Southwest was not New Mexico or Arizona. It was an area that became the states of Mississippi and Alabama uh, or Southwest or the panhandle of Florida. And Jackson was deeply involved for more than 20 years in the effort to, to put it brutally, clear that area of Indians, uh, relieve them of their real estate, and move them out west of the Mississippi. Having told that story, having learned that story, I wanted to go on and uh, learn more of it and learn more about America's westward expansion, which is how I came to the story of the Fremonts. John Charles Fremont, as I'm sure many people watching know, uh, at least a little bit, maybe a lot. John Charles Fremont was a Western explorer. In 1842, he set out on a US Army expedition to map a portion of the Oregon Trail, getting as far as uh, the Continental Divide and just a little bit farther in what is now Wyoming. He went on several more expeditions but one of the things that I learned about him that made him so interesting was that, and, and I think that makes him in a way uh, symbolic of the story of the West. He was exploring, but it was not entirely new ground. Of course, there were native nations that had traveled that ground for generations. And there were even by the 1840s, 
a generation or two of American fur trappers, even a handful of settlers who had traveled the Oregon Trail, who had moved out into uh, the, the Great West, as the Fremonts like to call it, to distinguish it from that other West of states like Indiana. And he was not traveling entirely unexplored ground for the most part. His job, his mission was to publicize. He was mapping that territory so that it would be better known. He was mapping the trails so the trails would be easier and safer to follow. And he was coming back to his home base in Washington, DC, which is where I am right now, uh, to write best-selling accounts about his adventures. He was good at newspaper publicity. His name was in the papers all the time as every movement was covered by the papers. He would write these official reports for the United States Army. He was a US Army officer, part of something called the Corps of Topographical Engineers that took on missions like mapping the West. He was writing a report for his superior officer which is a thing that every army officer learns to do after every engagement or mission or anything else. And so ordinarily you would think it is a report for one person's eyes. And in fact, he would address it to his superior officer, but he was writing it as a book for the general public. And his reports, there were multiple reports as he went on multiple expeditions, would be published as books for the general public. And they were beautifully lyrically evocatively written. They were first person accounts of his adventures with sometimes a few dozen men moving through the American West. Uh, he went on a second expedition all the way up the Oregon Trail to Fort Vancouver, uh, what is now Vancouver, Washington, right across the river, of course, from Portland, uh, what is now Oregon, um, doing further mapping. And then uh, starting back at the beginning of winter, decided that it would be a very clever thing and a very smart thing to uh, not go back on the Oregon Trail, not go back on the safest route, not wait for the passage of winter, which would probably be the smartest thing given the severity of the mountains, but to try to hack out some new route through Oregon and across what is now Nevada to find some new trail that got back to the east. It didn't work. And he ended up realizing that he and his men were going to starve on the uh, western side of the Great Basin, the eastern slope of the Sierra Nevada mountains, unless they could hack through these snowbound mountains in the middle of winter and make it to the Central Valley of California and once there get supplies and try again a little bit later in the year to, to head home again. It was in that way that John Charles Fremont got to California for the first time. Uh, I mentioned this because in some ways he was a very strange and erratic leader who went on risky missions into semi-known territory. It certainly could be hazardous territory, uh, but he made his missions more hazardous than they need to be. He frequently risked the lives of his men. Uh, as we go through this book, eventually there'll be a mission where things will go catastrophically wrong for many of his men. But he was seeking some kind of drama. And I don't think maybe, maybe drama isn't exactly the word. He was seeking accomplishment. He was seeking some kind of triumph that he could share with the world. He was seeking some way to prove himself. And so he would take terrible and unnecessary risks. And then he would go home and turn these terrible risks into quite dramatic stories. When you read his account of going over the Sierra Nevada mountains, down into California, you almost feel like you were there with him. Um, and he's, he's a kind of an amateur scientist. He's a map maker, of course. And so he's making scientific observations along the way, even as his own men are going crazy in the snow from the uh, cold and the frostbite and the lack of proper food and the pure exhaustion and the fact that the snow might be six feet deep or even much deeper than that. He's making all these observations, but he's putting them in a book. Um, and he published these works in a way that made him one of the most extraordinarily famous men of his time. He's not as well known today, of course, uh, and there are reasons for that. But to know how famous he was, in his time, all you need to know is that there is a Fremont Peak in Wyoming. 
and a Fremont peak in California. There's a Fremont, Nebraska, which is where Senator Ben Sass is from. There's a Fremont, California, which is a bit newer. It's not from his time, uh, but it supplanted a different town called Fremont near Sacramento that so far as I can tell no longer exists. There's a Fremont neighborhood in Seattle, which is named after Fremont, Nebraska, where some people were from. There's a Fremont, Ohio, that got its name as the advocacy of a young lawyer named Rutherford B. Hayes, who later became president of the United States. There were things called Fremont all across America, and his explorations were so important, regarded as so important, that there was a magazine in 1850 that described John Charles Fremont as one of the world's three most important historical figures since Jesus Christ. According to the magazine writer, the other two were Columbus, who discovered America, which is, of course, not how we would phrase it today, George Washington, the founder of his country, the great country of the United States, and John Charles Fremont, who completed it, which is a thing that I want to talk about in a moment. But first, I want to bring in somebody, the other character, the other main character of this story, a person who helped to make him famous. Uh, his wife, Jessie Benton Fremont was a remarkable character all her own, and a major reason that Fremont became an important figure, and certainly a reason that he became such a famous figure. She was from an elite background, but she was not. She was the daughter of a United States Senator from Missouri, who had a big interest in the West. It was the westernmost state at the time, and he felt a paternal interest in the entire American West, Thomas Hart Benton. She was better educated than many girls were allowed to be. She was clearly ambitious in ways that her gender at that time would not permit. She wanted very much to be her father, Senator Benton's assistant. She used to tag along with him as a little girl as he visited presidents of the United States. She would tag along with him as a little girl as he went to his business in the United States Senate and he would drop her off at the Library of Congress for safekeeping so that she would have something to do. She learned languages well enough that she could converse with foreign diplomats in Washington in their languages. She had enough confidence that she was happy to make her case for various issues to multiple presidents, ranging from James K. Polk to Abraham Lincoln, a remarkable character but she could not do all she wanted because of her gender. She wanted to be, at one point she said to her father, she wanted to effectively live life as a man, abandon Washington society that she was expected to play a role in as a woman and be her assistant. Uh, she even cut off her hair to show her father how determined she was to do this. Her father, Senator Benton, uh, at that point had, up to that point, had encouraged her education, had treated her almost like a son, but this was a step too far. And he said, no, it's time for you to be a woman and get married and do all of those things. Uh, and so she did get married. She couldn't be his assistant, so she married someone who was destined to assist him. She eloped with this young penniless army lieutenant, John Charles Fremont, who had done a little bit of exploration as a subordinate of other characters up to then, but was on the verge of expanding his career. She eloped with him, and Senator Benton was soon using John Charles Fremont as his instrument in an effort to capture the Pacific Coast for the United States. And that is the heart of this story. That also is the reason for the publicity. John C. Fremont was a fantastic self-publicist with Jesse's help, because she was his editor, his publicist, his political representative, his sort of ambassador back in Washington when he was out exploring. The publicity was partly to make John famous, which it did, but it also had a strategic purpose. Senator Benton was a former newspaper man who had a keen sense of publicity, as politicians tend to, whether they've been in the media or not. And he wanted American settlers to move to the Oregon country, which was then disputed between Britain and the United States. Senator Benton was confident that if enough Americans settled in Oregon, it would naturally become part of the United States. He had reason to be confident of this 
because of American experiences in that older American West that I mentioned. There were several parts of the older American West, what we would now think of as the Deep South or the Midwest, that were captured from Indian nations or even from Spain, colonial Spain, because there were settlers there who seized control and made it a fait accompli. Senator Benton wanted the same thing to happen in Oregon. He could not, in a republic, order people to go and settle there. And so he wanted to entice them to settle there. And John Charles Fremont was his instrument. As Fremont became famous, he was promoting the idea of going down the Oregon Trail uh, over the mountains and settling uh, in the wonders of Oregon. And he was promoting the practicality of that journey. Americans were turning their attention to the West. There was an interest in settlement in the West. Fremont grabbed that movement, put himself at the front of it, expanded it, accelerated it, and also accelerated his career. In the end, uh, he participated in capturing even more of the Pacific coast than he intended. Senator Benton had in mind essentially the world we're living in now, where there was a United States that faced not the Atlantic coast so much as the Pacific coast, where there was a United States that had Pacific trading ports that could trade with India and could trade with China. Uh, he believed this would be great for his own city of St. Louis, Missouri, because all of that trade coming from China to Oregon would come down through some kind of trade route and end up in St. Louis, and St. Louis would be a great city. All politics are local. He had this vision. The vision at the beginning did not include California, but it became included. There was a new president, James K. Polk, in the 1840s, who had an idea of buying California from Mexico, and he sent uh, John Charles Fremont with 60 gunmen on an ambiguous mission, which I do investigate in Imperfect Union, uh, not exactly with orders to conquer the place, but not exactly with orders to entirely follow the law. They entered Mexican-controlled California. It was part of Mexico at that time, of course. And they thrashed around in Mexican-controlled California until finally they came in contact with the Mexican authorities who ordered them to leave, which Fremont did not quite do. And he engaged in a number of small, strange, somewhat partial, occasionally deadly battles, as well as massacre, massacring Indians on a number of occasions, um, until such time as California settlers rose up uh, and declared their independence, what became known as the Bear Flag Republic, which I'm sure many people watching here know that is the origin of the bear on the California flag even today. John Charles Fremont was present for that, was something of an instigator behind it, and when it became clear that it might succeed, put himself at the front of it and created his reputation as the conqueror of California. Um, he became an even more extraordinary American hero as a result of those events. Now, when you investigate it, uh, there, and maybe we're gonna talk about this with Emily a little bit more, I don't know. When you investigate this, you find a little bit less to all of these stories than, than it seems. He was someone of extraordinary accomplishments who had a talent for making them more extraordinary. There was a particular occasion on one of his explorations in which he decided simply for the glory of it, to climb the highest mountain that he could find. He put a number of his men at risk climbing with him. They didn't plan the mission very well. They nearly died a couple of times. It took them extra days to get up to the top. They got up to the top of this mountain, planted the American flag on top, and Fremont looked around. It was 1842, and he decided this must be the highest mountain in all of North America. And so he came back and wrote of his triumph of planting the American flag on the highest spot on the continent. And people celebrated this. It was like the moon landing, planting the American flag on the moon in 1969. Uh, of course, he had no reason to know that it was the highest mountain in North America. There weren't very many people who had been to the top of very many mountains uh, with instruments to measure barometers and so forth to measure the altitude of any mountains. It turned out it wasn't even in the top 100 mountains uh, in North America, but he got this success and it was part of his fame, which led ultimately 
to a political career, which is one more part of this extraordinary story. John Charles Fremont, by participating in the capture of California and the rest of the Southwest, participated in a war that intensified the American conflict over slavery. The United States at that time was divided into Northern states that had gradually abolished slavery and Southern states that had ever more firmly embraced it. And the capture of territory in the West created this burning question of whether it would be slave territory and free territory. And although it took more than a decade, that battle over territory in the West gradually intensified and led to the American Civil War. It also led along the way to the creation of the Republican Party, which had not existed until the 1850s. It was the first major national party that was an anti-slavery party. It was opposed to the expansion of slavery into the West. It was created at a moment of great demographic change in America, a moment of great social change in America, and the Republicans in their very first presidential campaign decided that to coalesce this party, to bring its different elements together for their first campaign, they needed some super famous figure, and they chose John Charles Fremont, who ran in 1856. He was the Republican nominee. He was very famous, and by then, his wife, Jessie Fremont, was also extraordinarily famous, and in fact, to some people, it almost seemed as if a husband and wife team were running for president. It was widely understood that she was perhaps politically smarter than he was, perhaps in many ways smarter than he was, uh, had probably made fewer mistakes than he had made. And women were involved in the anti-slavery movement and took her up as an anti-slavery uh, anti symbol. It was in many ways a modern campaign and it was a story that points me to many of our modern struggles because it was a time of a changing America. It was a time of a diverse America that was becoming more so. The United States had captured not only California, but all the people in it. Hundreds of thousands of Indians, thousands of Mexicans who with the change in borders became listed in the United States Census as foreigners, even though they were in California where they had been born. It was a time of increasing diversity where Americans had to struggle with that. It was a time of great immigration and there was an anti-immigration movement that was a major factor in that 1856 campaign. And it was of course a battle over race because it was a debate over slavery. And it was a time when a divided America was changing demographically. In the 1850s, this is what the change was. The North, the anti-slavery section, had become ever more populous and became more populous still when California entered the Union in 1850 as a free state. And by becoming more and more populous, it became possible for the North to elect a president conceivably with Northern votes alone. This was seen as a profound threat by the South. The South had always had great influence in Washington and suddenly saw itself shut out of power in Washington. They would no longer have half the Senate because they traditionally had half the states. They might no longer have a president again. And Southerners argued that if a Republican ever won, they would secede from the Union. Now, the Republicans narrowly lost, somewhat narrowly lost, in 1856. John Charles Fremont failed, but the Republican cause, the anti-slavery cause continued. And Abraham Lincoln pursued the presidency with essentially the same strategy that Fremont had in 1856 and Lincoln won, which brought on the Civil War. So it was this period of profound change in America, demographic and otherwise, which created profound anxiety. And I think it's one of the reasons that this tale, one of many reasons, honestly, that this tale feels relevant now. Now, if you read the book, you'll decide if I bring out the relevance or not, but the material, there's no doubt about it, how it reflects upon our time. And one of the lessons that I've learned in going through this material is that politics 
becomes especially tense and even potentially violent when people become convinced that their side is losing forever. One of the great blessings of a democracy, part of the genius of a republic, is that you lose the election maybe, but there's always going to be another election. You run for office, you lose, you can run again. Your candidate loses, you can run again. Your cause loses, you can fight another day. There'll be another election next year, two years, four years from now. It goes on and on. Nothing is ever over. But there are periods where the country is changing, where one side or both sides have feared that they will be shoved out of power forever. The 1850s leading up to 1860 was such a time in which Northerners said, if the South is able to expand into the West and create new slave states, they will have too much power and they will control us. And the South said, if the North succeeds in this gambit of a Northern only presidency, elected only with Northern votes, we are shut out of power forever. And that fear, justified or not, drove people to extremes. It is a circumstance that we find familiar today, I think. We've just been through an election where one side was persuaded that if President Trump won a second term, it would be the end of democracy. And many people on the other side were told by President Trump, this is, and this literally said this in campaign speeches, this is your last chance. It is your last chance before we're overwhelmed by illegal immigrants, in effect, before we're overwhelmed by demographic change, by people who are not like us. Um, that is a large part of the fuel that drove extreme politics in the 1850s. It's a large part of the fuel that has driven extreme politics in our time, and it's a large part of our legacy. Um, one thing to remember, though, and this is the last I'll say before I turn it over to Emily, we should remember that even after 1860, even after the southern states seceded, even after they fired the first shot and triggered the deadliest war in American history, there still was another election. In a democracy, if you keep it, nothing is ever over. There was an 1864 election in the middle of the war. There was an 1868 election. After the war, the fight continued for better or worse. And various causes we can think about, like the cause of freedom and equality, the cause of anti-slavery, the cause of racial equality after the war, it goes on and on. Sometimes we suffer a setback. Sometimes we leap forward. Very often we lurch sideways. Most of the time I think we're in the middle of things and we don't know if we're going forward or backward. I'm aware that most Americans uh, tell pollsters that uh, we are going backward as a country right now, that things are terrible as a country right now. And it doesn't even matter how you feel about who won the election. Uh, people feel the country is in a terrible state. And there are many objective reasons to think so, from the deaths of the pandemic to the assault on the United States Capitol to any a number of other things, the economic distress, any number of other things we could go through. And yet, as a journalist, as a historian, I'm not convinced that we know which direction things are headed now. I'm not convinced that we know for sure which events were the terrible ones and which events however terrible, may, like the Civil War did, bring an advance in our society. And I'll stop there. Um, John Z. Fremont clearly was a remarkable human being. For those of us here in California, of course, his historical significance is quite enormous. He was the first military governor of California, first senator from California. And then, of course, as you rightly say, becomes the Republican Party's first presidential candidate in 1856. So those bare facts alone, I think, constitute a pretty strong claim on our attention today, a century and a half later, more than a century and a half later. And I, let me just interject before I hand it over to Emily Greenfield. Um, but I found your book a remarkable, a remarkable combination of the panoramic and the intimate that you give us both the big picture, the big historical framework in which this drama is unfolding, 
but also give us a feeling and an appreciation for some of the most intimate aspects of the relationship, <clears throat> especially between man and wife, between John and Jesse, but also the personalities of other players in the story too, like the uh, horrible personality of Kit Carson. <laughs> Uh, and the ambiguous personality, I guess I'll call it, of Thomas Hart Benton. So I, I found the book a really informative and enjoyable read. I'm going to hand the uh, reins over here to Emily Greenfield to have a bit of conversation with Steve and to uh, field some of the questions that are coming in from those of you out there in the digital world. Uh, Emily is a graduate of Colgate University, Colgate University and an advanced PhD candidate here in the Department of History at Stanford. Uh, she has a special interest in issues involving slavery and race in the 19th century, which uh, qualifies her as an eminently sensible interrogator for or interlocutor with uh, our author today. Um, Emily did have a life before graduate school. Uh, she was the uh, director of strategic communications at uh, Thomas Jefferson's Monticello in Virginia. Uh, and she was also an Emmy Award winning producer for CBS News uh, Face the Nation with Bob Schieffer. So uh, Emily, I'm gonna hand it over to you to have a bit of conversation with uh, Steve and please take it away. Thanks, David. Uh, Steve, I wanted to say first, you, whether you knew this or not, you read me the news this morning as I drank my coffee and now I get to close out my day talking to you about history. So that's pretty much a perfect Tuesday in, Thank in you my for, books. I appreciate that. Um, before we talk about John and Jesse, and there's lots to say there, I want to pull back the curtain and ask you just one question about process. Sure. So you seem to have, um, on a regular basis, one foot in journalism and one foot in history. And I think I should probably be asking you how you find time to do both of those things. But what I'm really curious about is how you approach these two projects. So how is researching and writing history different from researching and writing the news? One feeds off the other. One can be also a relief from the other. And every once in a while, you fear also that you're looking in the wrong direction at the wrong time. Um, studying history has given me a richer appreciation of the news that I cover every day. Um, and there are references to history that prop up in my crop, crop up in my news writing all the time. Sometimes it's really explicit, you know, I'll write uh, something for the Atlantic about Abraham Lincoln or Andrew Jackson or for the New York Times about the Fremonts. Sometimes it's more implicit. It influences the questions that I ask in interviews. When I'm interviewing somebody on the radio, um, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe this will surprise you, maybe it won't. I mean, there you, you can, as an interviewer, sit there and think, well, there are questions that I kind of have to ask or you can think there are questions I can ask that make me seem really smart, or you can let those things go, which I hope interviewers do, uh, or at least what I try to do. Maybe others have a different idea. You can let those things go and just ask questions that you really want to know the answer to and that you think really matter. Not little procedural questions, but questions about the big issues about where a policy is going, how people will really be affected over time how it's really different from uh, how it's been done in the past. And I would like to think, if I do it right, which others will judge, that studying history is a great way to have that long perspective on what feels like really matters. Um, studying history also helps me with the news because I keep seeing earlier versions of the rhetoric that we use today earlier versions of the paranoia that people may apply today, earlier versions of the uh, racial rhetoric that people will use today. Uh, we collectively, uh, those who may use different kinds of you know, racism, uh, let's, let's just admit that some people do, uh, have become much more subtle about it. And yet the appeals resonate with things that have been said in the past. I think actually some of the ways that we've cleaned up our racial language in this country have actually obscured things rather than improved things because people say racist things, but they don't use the N-word anymore. And so they don't even quite recognize that when they're talking about crime in cities, for example, that they're talking about black people and the fear of black people. Um, so you get a perspective on that from studying an earlier time in American history and seeing some of the same appeals just with the words changed uh, a little bit. 
Um, covering the news also influences how I write history because I write, uh, there's a lot in this book that's set in Washington, DC, that's set in the White House, that's set in the United States Capitol. And I've been inside and all over those buildings as a reporter in some of the different rooms in the White House where things happen. Um, the old House of Representatives chamber is now Statuary Hall and you can walk around in it. Um, uh, tragically, a, a mob was streaming through it on January 6th. That was the home of the House of Representatives where a lot of important things happened in the 19th century and even today is filled with statues of figures that were sent by each of the 50 states and were for one reason or another considered great by various of the 50 states, even though I think a lot of us, a lot of us would consider some of those figures awful people if we got into it, but some of them are fascinating. Um, anyway, so as it, a journalist, I get in there and I get, I get a chance to see that and they bounce off each other. I was going to say it's interesting because this book reads as a very modern story. And so the intersection of sort of journalism history that you're describing makes a lot of sense in that vein. Okay, um, let's let's get to the Fremonts. One of my favorite 19th century sources is a series of US history textbooks that run from 1828 to 1873. So most of both Fremont's lives. Um, and I checked this morning and Fremont appears, John Fremont appears zero times in the wow. 1843 edition of the book. Uh -huh. but 10 years later, by 1853, he appears a whopping 31 times, more times than Thomas Jefferson. Hmm. So. To me, this is one of the stories that your book unpacks, this kind of rapid ascension from obscurity to Jefferson or Jesus level fame, you know, yeah. in under a decade. And what I thought I'd ask you first is to ruminate on the set of forces that collide to make this possible. I mean, how did Americans discover John C. Fremont? Well, there was his gift for publicity. Um, and I think that he, I mean, I argue that they invented celebrity. I don't mean to say they were the first ever famous people, but they invented a particular kind of celebrity where you generate it yourself through your own work for publicity while you're actually performing the event. It's not that you are famous years later for a battle that you won, or you're famous for the position that you hold like president. He was never president, but he's going out and having these adventures in the West and like leaving word in the newspaper at St. Louis what he's doing so people can follow his progress and making sure to find a reporter when he gets back. Um, and that leads to the next point that led to his and their really extraordinary fame. And that's the development of the news media. Since you know this period well, you know that this was a period of great expansion of newspapers. There was a time at the beginning of the country where there were dozens of weekly newspapers and then a handful of daily papers but by the 1830s and 1840s, we're talking about many, many hundreds of papers, and a number of them are even daily newspapers. And in 1844, Samuel Morse demonstrated the telegraph, which within a very few years connected all of the major cities in the United States and what we would see as the Eastern United States now anyway. And they were used to transmit news instantly. Um, and when you search databases that are now available of these hundreds of papers, you can watch, <coughs> excuse me, a Fremont story, a tale of some exploit, leap from paper to paper to paper to paper. It might take weeks, it might take months, but a newspaper either with a telegraphic dispatch or simply by mail, they would get a story and they might reprint the identical story they'd received in the mail from another newspaper, the same way that we would share things on Twitter today, or that you know one of those news aggregator sites, Huffington Post or whatever, might rewrite somebody else's story with their own spin. Newspapers would take the news from other papers and repeat it. And so there was this gigantic national conversation that was becoming richer and deeper and speeding up dramatically just as the Fremonts came on the scene. Um, they were famous in short because they worked at it, because the media were available to make it possible for the first time in that way, and also because they attached themselves to a great narrative, the narrative of America's westward expansion, which to many white Americans was the story of the country at that time. So let's let's talk about that 
narrative a little bit. Um, you did you did this a bit for us in your comments, but I'm hoping I can ask you to give us a bit more of a geography lesson. Sure. What did the West actually mean when John set out with his team in the 1840s? And how did his work change American notions of the West? Yeah, um, I was fascinated to encounter this uh, phrase, the Great West, that Fremont uses in his writings. And it appears he called what we know as the West, the Great West, to distinguish it from that other West that was Indiana and Illinois and, and Alabama and Mississippi and, and that sort of thing. So it was this gigantic area that had, uh, as far as the Louisiana Purchase went, belonged to the United States for a couple of generations. And then it was this undecided territory of Oregon. And then it was Mexico. Uh, it was three giant chunks, each of which was the size of an empire anywhere else in the world. And it was well known by individuals who had been through individual parts of it but not well understood as a whole. Uh, you, meant, you asked for a geography lesson. John C. Fremont was giving the whole country a geography lesson because he mapped areas that were not understood. People didn't understand how the continent worked. Um, people didn't understand like the continental divide. That was not a thing people had quite mapped or gotten in their heads. People didn't understand where the rivers flowed. Um, there apparently was a map, Fremont describes this map uh, in the Library of Congress at that time that showed the Great Salt Lake and three rivers flowing out of the Great Salt Lake and reaching the ocean at various points. There was supposedly a river that went from the Great Salt Lake all the way somehow through the mountains and flowed into the Pacific. And there was another river that went down, I think to the Gulf or something. Um, I mean, it was just uh, nothing that actually existed but there were maps that were based on some work of cartographers, the travels of explorers, and rumors and stories that had been passed down from different people, along with some speculation. Fremont was the person, one of his genuine uh, discoveries was the person, he was the person who established that if you go into the region of the Great Salt Lake, there's a vast area encompassing several states where no river ever reaches the sea. And he called it the Great Basin um, and mapped a good part of it and traveled around enough of it to confirm his hypothesis that there was no such thing as a river that went from the Great Salt Lake to California. So he gave a geography lesson just explaining what was there. Um, there were all these myths about a great American desert, um, which uh, there's different ideas of what people even meant by desert when they said that. But he established that whatever was in Nebraska, as we would now call it, it's, it wasn't desert exactly. Uh, it was something that you could travel through and you could find some wood and you could find some water. He also traveled through authentic deserts and found uh, ways through them. So he was just giving a coherent explanation, a far more coherent explanation of the West than America had previously had. But I do want to make one more point before I go on, because you asked me what the West was in the American imagination. It was resources. It was furs. It was, before too long, gold. It was money. It was land. Uh, I think, by and large, it was not thought of as a place that was already inhabited by people. And to the extent that it was inhabited, those people were considered an inconvenience. Um, it's really interesting to watch John C. Fremont's relationships with Indians because, I mean, he's obviously racist about them. Uh, he's obviously patronizing toward them. There are a couple of occasions in California and Oregon where he sends his men to massacre Indians for reasons that don't seem very good at all. Um, yet at the same time, he traded with Indians. He depended on them for sustenance quite often. Uh, he he relied on some Indians, even in his mission. Some of his men were Indian. Uh, he respected them on some level as individuals, but he was a believer in this idea of the westward march of civilization, that barbarians were out there and civilization had come from Europe and reached the Atlantic coast and was now moving westward and westward and westward. It's interesting, I think, in addition to the sort of physical mapping that you describe, 
you've touched on one of the really powerful themes in this book, which is that the Fremonts reflect both the kind of power of westward expansion as a political and cultural ideology and its darker undertones. That Fremont sort of lives both of those realities in in the way that he moves oh, in this yeah. historical space. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's this guy, I mean, he's not like a conqueror who's marauding around and deliberately committing genocide. He's actually, he thinks he's carrying the, the light of reason, you know, and of science. And in a way he is, I mean, it's a complicated story, but he's also participating in this awful event that made America what it is, but also harmed a lot of people along the way. So one other question on the, on the subject of westward expansion, which as you've described is closely related to the history of slavery in this moment. When I teach um, anti-slavery thought to undergraduates, one of the things we do together is kind of historicize that term. So we draw anti-slavery as a big tent that encompassed lots of different ideas. And we talk about how these ideas changed over time right. and how they weren't necessarily, most often weren't synonymous with kind of anti-racism thought as we imagine it in the 21st century. The next time I do that, I think I'm gonna use John C. Fremont, um, who is the sort of first presidential candidate of the party of Lincoln, but not of the later Lincoln moment in some way. So I wanted to ask you, what did anti-slavery mean to John Fremont and what did it mean to his wife? Oh, thank you for asking that. Uh, their record on slavery is better than a lot of people, but rather ambiguous. And you're exactly right. It's not anything we would approve of today if they showed up today with the identical views. Um, this is a period where there were anti-slavery advocates and also abolitionists and they were different people and if you were to call jesse fremont an abolitionist or john fremont an abolitionist that wouldn't exactly be right because abolitionist meant you were this crazy radical person who actually wanted to free all the slaves right away and believe that they should have the right to vote william lloyd garrison as early as 1831 was writing in his newspaper the liberator that the enslaved should immediately get the franchise and he was considered just a crazy out there radical. He also rejected the constitution, by the way, because it made accommodations with slavery. But there was this much more mainstream anti-slavery view, which held that slavery was bad, that it was unfortunate, a sort of historical tragedy, but that the South Southern states had a constitutional right to practice it, and that slave owners had certain rights and property that could not be messed with too much. And therefore, the South had to be left alone. Um, and there was a kind of stalemate. Uh, I'm now studying Abraham Lincoln, who is fascinating on this because for many years in his life, he's very definite that slavery, slavery is wrong and equally definite that there's nothing he can do about it. What changed with the conquest of the American West was it created this battleground where people could argue over slavery, where people like the Fremonts or people like later Abraham Lincoln could say, listen, I can't do anything about slavery in the South, but I can do something about slavery spreading into the West and I can stop slavery from spreading. And it was Lincoln's somewhat innovation ultimately to say, I wanna stop slavery from spreading because I want it ultimately to go away. I can't end it today, but I want it ultimately to go away. I wanna stop its spread to put it on the course to ultimate extinction. The Fremonts were in that category, just not as sophisticated as Lincoln. They were a little bit opportunistic in their anti-slavery record. Although I'm glad you know Jesse, she was from a slave owning family. Her father owned slaves all of his life. Her mother came from a slave owning family, but her mother in Virginia, but her mother turned against slavery, freed the slaves that she inherited and insisted on using free black servants in their home in Washington, D.C., and passed on her basic anti-slavery beliefs to her daughter. It's interesting on this and many other subjects, it seems to me that Jesse had clearer political yeah. ideas and convictions than her husband, who seemed in the way that you write him, much more comfortable sort of wandering in the woods than wandering in the halls of Congress. Yes, he was explicit about that. Um, and it's really remarkable, late in his life when he got started writing an autobiography with Jesse's help, um, he ends it with the conquest of California. He ends it with that period that David mentioned of being a semi-legitimate military governor of California and, and 
he has a line at the end about after that everything goes south and I had to go into the horrible world of, of you know dishonest men he preferred very much the earlier part of his life when he was out in the wilderness by himself so on that subject of California's conquest and I'm, I'm putting that in quotes intentionally we have a few questions um, that have been asked about that sort of moment and uh, I marked down your way of describing kind of John Fremont's role in this as he deserved credit, just not in the way he imagined. So can you tell us a little bit more about the kind of inadvertent role that he played in, in California joining the Union? Yeah, uh, he showed up in California. The Mexican War, the war against Mexico was coming, but communications were bad. The Telegraph hadn't gotten that far out west, and they didn't know. Nobody there knew if the war had come or not. And in this ambiguous but tense situation, Fremont showed up with 60 gunmen and said, I'm just passing through. I'm just an explorer. I'm looking for a better route to Oregon. And I thought maybe if you come to California and hang a right, um, you can uh, get to Oregon a little better than, than on the Oregon Trail. Um, and my men have just come over the Sierra Nevadas and we're going to hang out a little while uh, and rest and refit and get some new supplies. And we're going to stay out of the settled areas of, of California. This is what he told the Mexican authorities who didn't like it, but didn't do anything about it. And then Fremont began stirring up trouble. He began moving into settled areas. He began making the Mexican authorities nervous. He gave various explanations for why he was doing this. But the most fun, and I almost think the most plausible, is one that he gave late in his life. He said that he went to coastal California, the settled area of California, the Mexican settled area of California, because he was looking for some real estate to buy for his mom. Now, that says to me, I mean, it's just very in character, and it says to me, he already was looking at this land as his, his own. I mean, he was an intruder in a different country, but he's like, he got a chance to, to ride a boat at one point across San Francisco Bay, and he looks out at the opening to the harbor and it's eventually Fremont who gives it the name, the Golden Gate. He's like naming things and he's looking for property. He already in his mind owns this place and he starts acting like a jerk and having conflicts with the locals, acting like he's the local. And in the end, he, he gets confronted by military force. He thrashes around some more, makes a series of errors, all of which could have turned out tragically except that a U.S. Navy squadron arrived off the coast in Monterey, California, and the commander of the squadron also knew that war might be coming, but not that it had come for sure. And he learned that Fremont was thrashing around doing these weird things and shooting at people in the interior, and he figured no U.S. Army officer would be doing those crazy things unless he knew the war had begun. And so the Commodore seized the ports, seized Monterey, seized what became San Francisco, seized other key points, and ran up the American flag. And suddenly, the United States had seized control of key parts of California and begun the conquest of California. The Commodore then summoned Fremont to find out by what authority he'd been attacking people. And Fremont said, I, I, I don't have any authority to do anything. Um, but the act had begun. And before too long, they did learn the war had begun and the United States had the advantage and never gave up California again. So what I mean by that line is that he conquered California for the United States or was instrumental in it, not by leading some brave army, not by claiming leadership at one point of the bear flag republic, but just by thrashing around and making mistakes in an unstable situation, which ultimately caused something to change. We just had someone ask whether this is a great American example of failing upward. Oh, my gosh, yes. He continued to fail upward. And I don't mean to say he was without skill. I mean, he was a very brave person and an accomplished map maker and uh, in some ways an effective leader of small groups of men. But then he rose to be a presidential candidate. Um, it was important that he was nominated. It was important to American history that the Republican Party coalesced around him and went on to elect Lincoln. But even some people around him who supported his nomination 
later said, thank God he was never president because it turned out he was a terrible leader of large groups of men. He became a general in the Civil War and was fired twice by Lincoln. So we maybe have time here for one more question. And I see a couple on the theme of um, the sort of longer relationship between the Fremonts and California. So tell us kind of where he ends up at the end of his career. Tell us where Jesse ends up. My understanding based on your book is that they feel very differently about, um, about the state. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's absolutely true. Jesse really wanted to get there. Of course, her husband had been there a couple of times, but finally after the conquest, uh, which I'm happy to keep putting in quotes for you, um, after it became part of the United States. She traveled by a somewhat safer route down by boat and across Central America to the other side to meet him in California. She wanted to be there. And they ended up living this kind of bi-coastal life going back and forth. He was elected by acclamation, one of California's first two senators. Uh, he was considered a great hero there. Uh, later, he lost his bid for re-election, by the way, because he just wasn't a very good politician. But he was considered this heroic figure. And at the end of their lives, late in their lives, in 1887, I believe, his health was failing. They had blown their money. He'd made a fortune. In the gold rush, by the way, we haven't even mentioned the gold rush. He bought land in California that had gold under it. Uh, he'd blown the fortune by 1887. They were poor but she managed to get a railroad magnate to Collis P. Huntington to hand them railroad tickets, and they moved westward to Los Angeles, where she intended for them to, uh, for him to be healthier in the climate and for them to end their lives. But this guy, he'd always been restless. He'd lived in the East, but was always restless, always wanting to go out into the West, always wanting to go out again, uh, spent a little time in Los Angeles, and then became restless again and started back East. And he ended up dying in New York City away from her. But she remained in Los Angeles and was considered a link to a brilliant past and a heroic figure. And after his death, when she was broke, women in Los Angeles <laughs> raised money to buy her a house for her to live. And so she ended her life, surely not the way that she wanted, but with a degree of respect and honor. Well, thank you, Steve. I'm watching the clock and I'm going to turn things back over to David. But the last thing I'll say is that for anyone who is stuck inside in the you know age of the pandemic, just the movement of people in this book across the United States makes it the kind of perfect read for for COVID time. So I hope all of you will enjoy it as much as as much as I did. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Emily. Uh, and thank you, Steve. And I want to join in uh, Emily's uh, recommendation of this as a really fine read and a particularly uplifting read or maybe uplifting is not quite the right word but energizing read there you go in these confined times because it does give us a sense of the, the sweep of space in the west and how fremont was uh, part of the, the mystique of, uh, of of conveying the mystique of the west to the american public more generally so you get a very strong recommendation from us steve inscape for your book imperfect union the title itself, of course, is a play on words. The imperfect union refers both to the perilous state of the United States then, not to mention now, and to the uh, marriage of Jesse uh, and uh, John Fremont as well. So I thank all of you for being part of this discussion today. Let me remind all of you who are interested that a week from today, at the exact same time, next uh, Tuesday, uh, February 9th, at 1 o'clock, uh, the Lane Center will be sponsoring another discussion on the way in which the Western states have dealt with the COVID crisis. And we'll particularly focus on the way the COVID crisis has surfaced elements of trust or distrust in the institutions that constitute our governments here in the Western states and how effectively they've addressed this crisis. So uh, a fraught and difficult subject, but one of compelling importance to all of us today. So Steve, thank you again. And uh, I'll see you on NPR tomorrow morning, or at least I'll hear you. Okay. Thank you so bye -bye. much. Bye-bye, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.